Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jill Loop. I'm Director of Economic Development for Roanoke County. Welcome and thank you for coming out on a cold morning to join us today as we envision the future of the 419 corridor. Today is our first meeting of businesses and property owners in the corridor. And on the agenda today, we are excited to welcome Dr. Michael Friedlander, Executive Director of the Fralin Biomedical Institute at Virginia Tech Carillion, who will speak today on the impact of growth at the Virginia Tech Carillion Health Sciences and Technology Campus and the impact that it will have on the corridor and the Roanoke region. We will also hear from Dr. Kimberly Dunsmore, Chair of Pediatrics at Carillion, who will share details about Carillion Children's and how it will become a catalyst for the growth at Tanglewood Mall and the surrounding area. <clears throat> Lastly, Deputy Director of Planning Philip Thompson will share an overview of the nearly 30 million in transportation and infrastructure improvements soon to be underway in the corridor and the 419 plan implementation, implementation next steps. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Friedlander. Dr. Friedlander serves. They're so excited already. <laughs> serves as the direct, executive director of the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute at Virginia Tech Carillion, as well as the vice president for health sciences and technology at Virginia Tech. He also works with Virginia Tech students as a professor of biological sciences, biomedical engineering and mechanics, and psychiatric and behavioral medicine, and is senior dean for research at the Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine. Dr. Friedlander has built the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute research program from zero to 125 million in grant value with 30 research teams and over 300 investigators and students over the institute's nine, first nine years. His extensive leadership in the biomedical discipline has earned him accolades throughout the field, including being recognized as a distinguished service member by the Association of American Medical College Board of Directors. We are honored to have Dr. Freelander with us as an instrumental contributor to the future of the 419 corridor. Now he will share details about the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute and the role it will play on the future of our community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Friedlander. Let me get you up here. It's on the desktop, so I'm not seeing it. is coming. We got you. Oh, you got it. F5. And there you are. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Jill, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming out this morning. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so some of you have heard me talk about this before. To those of you, I apologize for some redundancies. And to the rest of you, hopefully you'll uh, share in the excitement and enthusiasm you heard a little bit about already uh, from Jill. So these are a series of pictures uh, in the Roanoke Medical Center campus of various buildings. Of course, this is Roanoke Memorial Hospital, uh, the centerpiece of Carillion Clinic. This is what's called the Riverside Complex. It has the current Research Institute and Medical School. This is an exciting new component of the research enterprise I'll say more about. And here is the Medical School and Research Institute. So a lot's been happening. For those of you who've lived here a lot longer than I have, you've seen that area of the uh, uh, surroundings uh, change quite considerably in terms of the growth. So I want to give you a quick little background. I think most of you are familiar with Virginia Tech. Uh, is this a little bit too loud? Is it echoing? It sounds like it is to me, no? Okay, I'll leave it down a little bit. Anyway, uh, Virginia Tech, as you know, is a very powerful and successful what's called Research One University. These are some facts about Virginia Tech. Has a large number of programs, 33,000 students, few extra this year, as I'm sure you, you heard about. Uh, over $500 million in annual research expenditures that puts it in the top 5% of universities in the United States in terms of research. Uh, there's a little controversy about this number one in terms of research expenditures. Apparently, Virginia Tech and UVA are kind of going back and forth on that right now. Um, there's over a $1.5 billion annual budget, close to $2 billion in assets. It has a number of colleges, research institutes, a lot of alums from Virginia Tech, about a quarter million living alums. And then, of course, <clears throat> we have this academic health center in Roanoke in partnership with Carillion Clinic. 
And I'm sure many of you have heard about the great expansion of Virginia Tech uh, going on up in the uh, Northern Virginia area, uh, in the Alexandria area. And so this is a big, bold new step for the university, particularly in the areas of computer and data sciences, to be around the district uh, and grow our presence there as well. And then, of course, Carilion Clinic, you'll hear more about this uh, from Dr. Dunsmore in a minute. I want to make sure to uh, get these in here. But just briefly, you can see Carilion is a, a powerhouse of an institution, major employer in the area, <clears throat> significant annual budget, number of hospitals, employees, of course, the Children's Hospital, you hear more about from Dr. Dunsmore, and very much involved with uh, the enterprise at the Riverside campus. And Carilion also has major growth plans coming up in the future, as you'll hear more about again from Dr. Dunsmore, so I'm not really going to say much more about this, but leave it, leave it to her. And then with respect to the research enterprise, this is the picture that I just showed you a moment ago of a new building. This is a little bit dated photo. Uh, this building will open in June of this year. It adds an additional close to 150,000 square feet of new research space, and it'll add at least 25 new research teams. About another 450 people will be recruiting into the area. We're already recruiting right now for the first wave that'll be coming in this summer in that area. <clears throat> of course, we owe uh, a lot of uh, success to the support, incredible support of Mr. Haywood Fraylin, his wife Cynthia and their foundation who made a, a major gift this past year to the research enterprise to help us advance this and move it forward. So a little bit of background. Um, where did all this come from? What's the idea and what does the future look like? Firstly, the medical school uh, here, the Virginia Tech Hurlian School of Medicine is actually very different from any other medical school in the United States. It's called a research intensive medical school. And what that means is every medical student does research over four years, which is not typical of medical school education. It's based on this report that's now a decade old called the Scientific Foundations for Future Physicians done by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. <clears throat> I, I served on that panel before I came here, just the year before I came here actually. Um, and they, they decided that, uh, a steer group, um, decided that really American medicine was in deep trouble because we weren't training our physicians to keep up with the science of medicine. And we really needed a dramatic change where medical students early in training were exposed to the leading edge of the scientific foundations of, <clears throat> of medicine for the future. So this report suggested that, and luckily for me, <clears throat> it's about when I came here and got to work with the medical school on part of their curriculum, which was the research part of the curriculum. <clears throat> And that uh, started the school, and it's been very successful. A few little facts here about the students that have graduated already from the medical school. And, and there's lots more to say, but suffice it to say for this, the key thing is they're very active in research themselves, working in many cases with us in the Research Institute and also with our colleagues at Carilion Clinic. So it really is producing a different type of doctor that will be available to you and others throughout the United States who really knows and understands what's happening on the leading edge of the science of medicine, which is changing at an extremely rapid rate these days. <clears throat> Excuse me. The research enterprise focuses on a couple areas. These are the areas we focus on at the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute. Heart disease, cancer, brain disorders, and obesity. And the reasons for focusing on that, I think, are probably pretty clear to most of us. Uh, you can see some of the statistics beneath each of those. These are the major health drivers for the United States both in terms of human impact and financial cost. Uh, these are big numbers. When it comes to brain disorders, that's over one and a half trillion dollars a year uh, in cost to the United States. Just imagine what we could do with that money in this day and age with respect to infrastructure, education, environment, military, whatever your, your favorite area is, if we didn't have to spend it on that. And if you add those together with these other things, these are, these are big costs. <clears throat> so we're focused on these. We don't try to do everything. We try to focus on a couple areas where we can make a difference for the world, but also for the community in terms of advances in biomedical research. And the way we do that is we've sought out and recruited from all over the United States some of the top biomedical researchers in the world. And that's, those are their pictures up there, the Rogues Gallery, don't worry, I won't name everyone, um, although I could. Uh, but that aside, it does say the city above each one where they were recruited from. So it just gives you a sense of where we draw people from. There are a couple cities you see represented more than once, like Houston, Texas, Birmingham, Alabama. Those happen to be places that have <clears throat> world-class medical centers uh, from which we had connections to be able to recruit top researchers. But you can see this group <clears throat> comes from various areas. They focus on the four areas that I just told you about <clears throat> in terms of their research. 
<clears throat> now, what does it look like in terms of the people doing research at the Institute? This shows the number of people working at the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute. This includes students, so I could be a little careful with the data. These aren't all paid employees. Some of these are undergraduate students, for example, but nonetheless, you can see there's been a tremendous rise, and I think there's a fire marshal in the room. Um, that says about 650 people, and I think the fire code for our building is 400, but lest I get in trouble, they're not all in the building at the same time. And so some of these people, oh, thanks a lot. <clears throat> some of these people, uh, you know, come in for a semester, a few weeks here and there, and so forth. But it's, it's getting pretty packed, is the bottom line. This is the average salary for the people that work in the building. That's also a little bit misleading. It's not a normal distribution of salaries. There are different clusters of people. So, for example, our graduate students get paid about $45,000 a year. Uh, but that includes money they have to pay back for tuition, health care, et cetera. So they take home about $30,000, a little bit under that. Um, the workers in administrative and technical jobs average about $80,000 to $90,000, about $80,000 a year. And then you have the senior faculty leaders that I showed you before that run the teams that average close to about $200,000 a year. So you have basically three peaks in salaries when you're calculating what the potential economic impact and spending power of these folks will be. The students, uh, the workers in technical administrative support positions, and the lead faculty, basically. And you can work back from that to do some analyses, which we did later, of economic impact. <coughs> This is the distribution of the people that work at the Institute. You see they come in all kinds of different groups. We have lots of students. We have a bunch of high school students that work uh, at the Institute. We have undergraduate students, a couple hundred. We have graduate students working on their doctoral degrees. Some of the medical students, as I already mentioned, uh, do work there, faculty, technicians, et cetera. And this, uh, these are numbers I wouldn't expect you to really uh, know a whole lot about, but these are ways we measure how impactful the work that we do is the number of times we publish papers, the grants we get, the way our papers are cited by others in the world. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, those are very high numbers. So our, our faculty are really making a difference, not only in Roanoke, but worldwide. And then I'll say more about this <clears throat> in a moment, about companies launched, which is one of the things that we're very interested in doing more of. So what about students? This shows the distribution of students over the last four fiscal years working at the Research Institute. And they're divided into categories high school, undergraduate, graduate students, medical students. You can see the substantial increase. Just the last couple years, for example, the graduate students have gone up 19, 30, 23 percent per year. Uh, the undergraduate students have gone up by uh, uh, 50 percent, 50 percent again. So these numbers are continuing to increase as we continue to draw more people in to be part of these research teams that have been established. And the other thing that I'm very excited about, I'll share with you, this is brand new. Uh, we're launching it in the fall of 2020. This is a pilot program. We will scale it up over the next decade. And this involves what we call an immersion experience for students from Virginia Tech. So instead of all of those undergraduates being in Blacksburg trying to find a place to live and taking over the Holiday Inn and the Inn at Virginia Tech and so forth, we hope to have a number of those living in Roanoke. And so we're starting, instead of just programs where they come down for a few hours or a day to do research, full-time programs where they'll be immersed with all their courses as well as doing research, as well as activities going on at the medical center in the evening and so forth, and living in Roanoke. So we're piloting this starting this fall with a small number, 25 to 50 students or so, and we expect to scale that up by about 50 a year at about 500. So over the next eight to 10 years, that'll increase substantially in terms of the folks living here that are involved with the research enterprise. Now, I already mentioned uh, spin-offs, startup companies. Let me just tell you a little bit about that. The researchers, we hire are academics. They run laboratories in a university environment. They have to get grants, do the research, publish their papers, teach, all that stuff. But in addition, we hire people who are very entrepreneurial and want to see their discoveries go out and really impact the world. So many of them start companies, file intellectual property on discoveries they make, they start a company, they go out and get grants for the company, and then get investors to invest in the company and launch it to see if they can deliver the product. These are just a few examples of some of the companies our, our faculty members have started the last few years, and I'll just quickly show you an example of one or two. Uh, this is one that one of our investigators, Dr. Rob Gordy, started called First String Research. They've raised over $75 million in investments already. He started this company before he came here when he was at another university. Uh, it's got a lot of press. The Wall Street Journal's written it up. It's won a number of awards at the national level. Uh, it's, it won a prize in the White House for being one of the best startup companies in biotechnology in the United States. 
uh, and they're doing worldwide clinical trials on discoveries they've made for uh, compounds that can treat damage and wounds to the body, including heart attack and wounds and surgical scars, for example. Uh, <clears throat> and so that company's off and running. This is a picture of Dr. Gordy. He was one of those folks you saw in the rogues gallery. Rob's originally from New Zealand, trained in the United Kingdom, and then worked in Charleston, South Carolina before we recruited him here at Roanoke. He was sought worldwide for his innovative biomedical research, and we we're very fortunate to attract him to come here. This is just from about two months ago. Uh, he, his group made a major discovery on a molecule that can limit heart attack damage and start, stop it dead in its tracks within 20 minutes or so. And that compound is now out for clinical trials. And he's done a, a really cool thing with it. This little green ball is something that uh, lives in cells. It's called an exosome. And Rob has figured out a way to use it as what he calls a Ziploc bag. So he can take that little thing and open it with certain molecules and put in it the drug that he wants to deliver to treat the heart attack or the wound or the cancer, whatever it might be. That protects the molecule from being broken down by the body on the way to its target. And so using this technology that protects uh, the molecule from degradation, he started a new company around it called the Tiny Cargo Company. And that company is off and running. They've gotten funding from the federal government, from the Small Business Administration, uh, and they're now doing work taking it to the next stage. And I think this is a lovely local story because Rob found a partner here in the Roanoke area, the Homestead Creamery. So it turns out this cow and her friends, uh, when they make milk and before it's pasteurized, make lots of exosomes. And the folks at Homestead Creamery are uh, kind enough to share the unpasteurized milk with our investigators who extract the exosomes and then put them into these compounds that deliver these drugs. So it's a great partnership that includes a lot of, a lot of different folks. It's going to help people uh, in terms of their health, and we'll see how the company uh, does. We expect it'll do well. This is another one of the companies spun out from one of our labs called Beam Diagnostics. It stands for Behavioral Economics as Advanced Methodological Diagnostics. This was started by a gentleman named Warren Bickle, who we recruited uh, from Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, a number of years ago now and one of his trainees named Dr. Sarah Snyder. So they took this work <coughs> they were doing in the lab where they were studying addiction and why and how people become addicted to alcohol, opioids, other things, and how you can reverse that. And one of the things they wanted to do was to be able to assess very quickly, very accurately, and very cheaply whether somebody has a high proclivity for addiction and whether there's going to show recidivism after treatment. So they developed an instrument, basically. It's, it's really just a questionnaire with some sophisticated questions based on research Dr. Bickle has done. And around that, they've started this company called Beam Diagnostics, and they've had a tremendous amount of help. Some of the members of the community may know Cynthia Lawrence, et cetera. The regional accelerator at RAMP helped their country, uh, company get launched. Physicians at Carillion, uh, Anita Kablinger is a, psych a psychiatrist. And they also partnered with a group of the Corporate Research Center at Virginia Tech using some of their technology. So that company is now <clears throat> off and running. Um, they've received funding, as I said, from the federal government. They've received funding from the National Institutes of Health. They've moved into a validation phase two uh, series of trials and are looking for major investment now to move that company forward. So it's another example of a great idea in a lab that spins out, involves trainees as well as faculty, starting a company here, hiring other people, and bringing in investment dollars. Another example is this company called Akamal Research, started by this gentleman, Dr. Sammy Lemui. Sammy is originally from France, trained in San Francisco and Los Angeles, and we recruited him here about five years ago. Uh, he has a lab, just like the other investigators. He's interested in cancer research. In particular, how, it, how to go after the most deadly cells in cancer, what are called cancer stem cells. I'm sure many of you read about and heard about stem cells. We all hear about the great things. We can use stem cells to reprogram tissues in our body and repair things. That's the good side of stem cells. The bad side of stem cells is when you have certain cancers and they're removed, such as in a surgical resection, it comes back often. And the reason it comes back is these cancer stem cells remain and then they continue to proliferate. So Dr. Lemui discovered a major uh, identifying molecule in the cancer stem cells and a way to get at them and treat them for brain cancer, colon cancer, and breast cancer. He started a company around that called Akamel, uh, and they're now, uh, they got an award, a small business award uh, called SDTR from the NIH and the Small Business Administration, and they're now closing on their first venture round of capital investment in the company. So again, another great example of a spin-off company. So there are more examples. I wanted you to see a little bit of how it works. So where does the money for all this come from? 
Initially, the money came from a major investment from Virginia Tech and Carillion. On this graph below are shown research expenditures, millions of dollars, starting in fiscal year 10, right up through the close of last fiscal year, July 1. In the blue is shown the startup or bootstrap investment from Virginia Tech and Carillion Clinic. And that was a substantial amount of money, about $50 million that was spent over about five years. And that's now gone, unfortunately. That's been used, but it was used the way it should have been used to catalyze and start this. What is shown, without going into a lot of details of all the other colors, but just all these colors that are orange and yellow and these other things, this refer, these refer to funds that are brought in from the outside, what are called sponsored programs. They're grant dollars, basically. They come in different flavors. That's why the different colors and so forth. But nonetheless, this is new money coming in to the state. This is not money recirculating. This is money that would not come to the Commonwealth that we're competing for in federal grants that are extremely competitive. Success rate is between 5 and 10 percent at best. Failure rate's over 90 percent to work to get these grants. So these investigators are very good. They actually have a success rate of close to 40 percent on these grants, which puts us at 8 to 10 times the national average. What that means is we have really good people here that are, who are thought very highly of by their peers who evaluate these grants. So these are the expenditures. These are the actual grant awards shown in individual fiscal year and total value. And uh, this is updated now with fiscal year 20. And as was said earlier, we're well over $125 million in an active grant portfolio. So each of those grants to an investigator is like running a small business. You have to manage the money. You have to renew the grant successfully. You have a product, which are your discoveries, your publications, etc. And then you have to maintain a workforce and keep the technology going. So you can think of each of those 30 teams like a small business, anywhere from five or six employees to 30 or 40 employees in each one. And they're running more or less semi-autonomously in the uh, integrated Freeland Biomedical Research Institute. And they're competing for these grant dollars and doing quite well. Where, where does that money come from? By and large, the largest part of it comes from the National Institutes of Health, or NIH in Bethesda. About 80 to 85 percent of the dollars we get were awarded from there. But we also compete for federal dollars from other agencies, including uh, the Department of Defense, uh, the Center for Disease Control, the Veterans Administration. We also have a small but growing portfolio from private foundations like the American Heart Association, private companies, there's a company called Indivior. This is an investment capital firm from Europe who's come to Roanoke, has heard what's happening here, and is interested in investing in our startup companies, for example. And then we also have major industry partnerships. Some of the big ones are shown here, Siemens uh, out of Germany from Erlangen. Uh, we just are signing a new agreement with a major uh, company from Europe known as Brooker. Uh, they make high field magnets for imaging organs in the living body, the heart, the brain, et cetera. And we're actually acquiring the latest, uh, newest version of this. And they're designating Roanoke as the world site for development of that technology. And because of that, they're actually going to give us a lot of things for free to uh, utilize the new technology. So it'll make this place a hub that will bring investigators from all over the world to learn here about that technology and, and a few others. So we, we work with federal agencies. We work with private foundations, and we work with private industry as well uh, for the funding. And, and a number of terrific things that come out of this, I'll just highlight one or two. Uh, about two or three months ago now, the FDA, uh, Food and Drug Administration, uh, deemed a test that our group is working on in collaboration with Carillion Clinic, a, a breakthrough device uh, for diagnosing traumatic brain injury and concussion very rapidly, very accurately, and at point of care such as on an athletic field or in, in the field someplace else, for example. And so our investigators are working on this in partnership with a company known as Brainbox Intelligence Solutions. We have another team that's working on <clears throat> novel treatments for brain cancers. You may have seen in the paper in the last week or two stories about the great work at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Virginia Tech for treatments of malignant brain tumors known as glioblastoma. This is the same malignant brain tumor that humans get. Dogs get it as well. So we've developed a, a growing partnership with the College of Veterinary Medicine to do uh, collaborative research on diseases that affect both us and our pets. And that not only can help the pets, but it can help humans going through clinical trials, for example. And this is an example of some very exciting work going on on, the, uh, on these cancer stem cells, again, for brain cancer in dogs. And uh, this picture up here just reminds me to say the new building that will be opening in uh, May or June We'll have a number of fantastic facilities, and one of them is shown here. This is a linear accelerator, but this will be from the vet school to treat pets with cancer. 
And so this will become a des destination site instead of going to uh, North Carolina State University if your dog, for example, has cancer for treatments that take weeks. Uh, you'll come here if you choose uh, for one, one treatment uh, for the cancer with the leading edge technology for that. And that'll be part of research programs that also feeds into developing treatments for humans as well. So we're very excited about this partnership in Roanoke that includes both human and animal health research. Uh, one of the biggest areas of uh, health research nowadays is indicated here. It's what's called health behaviors. Uh, there's a lot on this slide. I won't go through it in too much detail. Just say that Dr. Bickle has developed an approach that he's learned with addiction studies and ported it to studying various health behaviors such as eating behavior, exercise, medical compliance. Do you take your medicine? Do you fill your prescription? Uh, various things like that. And it's known that well over half and perhaps close to 75% of every dollar spent in the United States on healthcare is spent on self-inflicted injuries, things we do to ourselves, i.e. we choose to smoke, 480,000 deaths. We choose to overeat and become obese and get heart disease or diabetes, and the list goes on and on, or we choose to drink too much, whatever it might be. <clears throat> if we can get a handle on the behavioral science of how to change the trajectory of those things, we can rapidly change the deployment of resources in the country in addition to making for a healthier society. So we have an entire center built around that that Dr. Bickle and his colleagues are working on, a very important part of uh, what's going on. Another thing we're focusing on is health of children. You're going to hear more from Dr. Dunsmore about the great work Carillion is doing with their children's hospital and the expansion of that enterprise right out here. On the research side, one of the areas we focus on at the Research Institute are injuries to children's brains early in life. Most people are not aware that children have strokes, and as a matter of fact, a lot of strokes, particularly babies, that can be in utero at the time of birth or parturition or soon thereafter. And the blood vessels in the baby's brain can be mechanically fragile and tear due to mechanical trauma and bleed into the brain, that's a stroke, or there can be a blockage in the blood vessels, that's a different kind of a stroke. When that happens, a child will develop various symptoms due to the damage in the brain. One of the conditions you may have heard of is called cerebral palsy where the child is not able to use that part of the brain effectively to control the body. We have a group of researchers led by Dr. Sharon Ramey and Dr. Stephanie DeLuca who developed a new interventional treatment to treat these children and rehabilitate their brain. We have children coming from all over the world to Roanoke for this therapy. <clears throat> it's a research treatment, so it's called a research clinic, but nonetheless it's being used clinically. And this year, the National Institutes of Health, uh, the, the uh, Schreiber Institute for Child Health and Development, um, awarded the first pediatric uh, stroke net trial to uh, the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute, first one in the country. And we're working with a number of other organizations, Stanford University, et cetera, is listed here, but we're the lead on that because our people invented the technology uh, and we're using this now and getting it out to people all over the country based on something that was developed right here, which we're very proud of. This is a, another exciting new thing that's about a, almost a year old now, I guess, or eight months or so. It's called a CTSA, Clinical and Translational Science Award. This is a partnership we formed with the University of Virginia and uh, of course Carilion Clinic, but also a Nova Health System up near DC. And we've created a statewide consortium or network to do research on clinical data. That is data related to patients from the various health systems around the state. And by working together and bringing best practices to bear on that, we can do much more as a state in that regard. So even though we compete sometimes, the neighboring universities, we can also work together and do things together. And we're happy to work with our colleagues at UVA on this particular substantial project. It's about a $23 million award for that project. All this leads to a variety of things. And one of the things that I think may be most important to the economy of this region, even though there's some other obvious ones like jobs and the money coming back into the community, is identity and brand because ultimately in the long run, it's about that. If you're gonna grow an area and find it to be attractive to others to come here and grow the opportunities for the population in that area, you have to get the word out. <clears throat> now, it's one thing to be paying your own money to get the word out and running ads and all that, and I understand that's an important part of any communications strategy. But it's something else when others, unsolicited, highlight your area, your city, your region to the rest of the world and we're having a lot of that uh, good news lately. And these are just a couple examples of things going on lately. I won't go through them all, but a variety of media. This is Business Wire uh, talking about a new, uh, this new treatment I told you about actually with Dr. Bickle, for example. This is something that was run in the national press about new treatments our folks have developed for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. I already told you about this FDA breakthrough 
uh, device. This is just a, a new recruitment of somebody we're bringing to the area. He'll be here. Actually, he's coming to town today to buy a house, but he'll be here permanently in January. Who brings an incredible research program on the genetics of uh, child developmental disabilities. Uh, recently, we started a new cancer initiative that was featured in something called the Cancer Letter nationally, with folks all over the country and all over the world read about what's happening in Roanoke. Uh, and the list goes on. So the point being, a lot of this is coming to the attention of the national and international media. It's very satisfying to see Dateline Roanoke and this and that going on. You read it in The Guardian or uh, press from Europe, Asia, South America, as well as all over the country. So I think that brand identity enhancement is an important part of what this all contributes. And one of the reasons that happens is about technology. <clears throat> After all, Virginia Tech is named Virginia Tech and we don't want to forget the tech word. So one of the things we do that's a little different than a lot of other academic medical centers in the United States is we focus on technological innovation. And this slide has a whole bunch of pictures and names that I won't go through of exciting technologies that either are in place right now or we're in the process of acquiring for the new research building that will open in a few months. Some of these are one in the world, one of a kind in the world. And again, will be attractions to our colleagues and others who are interested in advancing the technology of medicine to come here and be part of the leading edge of research. So we're re really excited about this and we, we push hard on this front. Last couple things I want to mention quickly. One is outreach to the community. We try to do as many programs as we can. Uh, we're, we're doing research, that's our day job and keeping that going, but we're training students and so forth. But we like to share with the community whatever we can, not only in an event like this, but we run programs. Some of you I know have been to some of these programs. I recognize faces. One of them was <coughs> supported and endowed by uh, Mr. Maurice Strauss called the Distinguished Public Lecture Series. And we bring in uh, various people who are leaders in their area to speak to the community, not to speak to the scientists at the Research Institute, although we attend, but they're, they're there to speak to you all about topics that should be of interest, we hope, to the community. So these are just a few we've had recently. Here's one who'll be here next week, Vicki Arroyo. She directs the Georgetown Climate Center. We'll speak, be speaking about climate change policy people in place. She's a lawyer uh, and a faculty member at Georgetown, has been very involved on a number of leading national commissions on leading uh, policy with respect to how we address the issues of climate change in coastal areas and other areas around the United States. So those are on Thursday evenings at 5.30. The public is invited, they're free. Not every Thursday, but like one every few weeks or so. But anyway, we're doing a lot of this and we hope the community takes advantage of it. We, we, I speak to each of these people before they come and remind them, you're talking to a general community. Don't give a scientific lecture that only scientists can understand, for example. And so these are policy people, lawyers, uh, heads of associations, uh, authors, presidents of universities, physicians, scientists, et cetera. It's a great program and, and we get good feedback from the community. So I'll just close by a little bit about where we think this is all going with a few pictures, <clears throat> best ones I could find on the internet um, of the area. So this is an aerial view of the Riverside campus, just to orient you, downtown Roanoke is somewhere around there. Somewhere in there is the Wells Fargo building. I think that's it. That would mean this would be Jefferson Street running here. Here's Carillion Roanoke Memorial Hospital. Here's uh, the ball fields in the area, soccer fields, baseball fields, etc. Here's the Riverside campus. Right there is the Biomedical Research Institute. There's the medical school. This is where the new Research Institute building is going, Carillion's outpatient clinic. Anyway, um, as you can see, there's still some property in this area. Carillion has some plans for things. We have some plans for things. And these are some of the things that are on the table from the research uh, end of, of things. One is to establish an incubator for our spin-off companies in the area. Uh, the other is to build uh, areas of new focus, such as climate health, I already mentioned, pharmacy. Uh, One Health, which is integrating human and veterinary medicine, public health, an entrepreneurs and residence program, at some point a biomedical industry park, and a national center for brain technology development. So these are just a few of the ideas we're, we're toying with right now. We're not locked in on any of those yet, but they're some of the ideas of the things we're thinking about. So there's more to come, <clears throat> I'm sure of that. I want to also highlight, uh, this is just behind the Riverside campus. This is the new Franklin Road Bridge that opened, I think, this past summer, if I remember correctly. It's a beautiful bridge. It's really, really nice, and it connects Franklin going all the way through, eventually coming out here. Uh, and it's really adding to the whole area in terms of accessibility. One of the great things is there are pedestrian and bikeways. We have a lot of people that like to ride bikes and walk. One of the reasons I'm able to recruit people from San Francisco, New York, Atlanta, and Houston is they can come here and do world-class research but they also can have a lifestyle where they can get to work, aren't caught in traffic for an hour, et cetera. This is really important stuff. And I know, sorry, and I know you all uh, deal with some of these issues. So 
I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see more of this happening in the community because it is a real selling point for allowing us to compete against some of the more established places. And of course, there's this uh, planned uh, interchange uh, coming up at some point suit that I've been reading about, and I just want to emphasize, I'm not sure I'm oriented the right direction here, but nonetheless, Franklin that comes through and all the way back and wraps around and runs into the Riverside campus, the way we see it from where we sit is that's confluent, and that is an area that the growth, these people that are coming in, they're not all going to pack in right around the medical center. They're going to have to go somewhere for where they live, where they shop, where they eat, where they drink coffee, where they drink beer, etc. And this seems like a natural connection to that point in many ways. Um, and I would just say, this is just another picture uh, coming out in this direction. Again, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> a little bit disoriented here. Oh, I see now. So here's, uh, um, here's the, uh, the uh, medical center over here. It's off, off picture. This is Reserve Avenue. And then here's Franklin coming through uh, down here. And so it's just a little turn right there that you come down Franklin. And I think the sort of things that you all are thinking about and interested in that would be conducive to you know, a good lifestyle for the people who already live here, but also help for the people coming to the area. We think about things like safety, bikes, sidewalks, uh, covered bus stops, streetscapes, healthy lifestyle retail choices. We could make a difference here. We don't have to, and excuse me, McDonald's, we don't just have to have McDonald's from one end of the street. I love McDonald's, by the way. Um, but we don't just have to have that. We can think ahead of the curve. We, Roanoke, and the area, and the county, can be an area that is really conducive to um, professionals and young people, people from retirees, from other cities who want to live here. This area does a great job on that. As we grow in this area around the research enterprise and the biomedical enterprise, I think we have an opportunity to do something different here uh, with the right kind of planning and work and coordinating. Why not have you know, healthy food places along that area? Why not have bike paths along that area? Places people can stop and take a break or sit under a bus shelter that are safe where you can get away from the traffic. Uh, foot traffic and bicycle traffic is key to the future. You can just go to DC and see all the peoples on scooters riding around taking their lives in their hands now on those busy streets. Um, we, could, we could make a difference here and there's a real opportunity. So we're excited to partner with the whole community, think about some of these ideas together and see what we can do to continue to help uh, contribute to the area. In terms of the economic impact, um, we've had various studies done. Uh, this study was done by Weldon Cooper and they expect about a half billion a year economic impact. Uh, coming from the uh, medical center campus. Of course, there's the whole Carilion Clinic economic impact on top of that. So these are, these are substantial numbers. And then I'll just close by, I always like to use this slide. I spent 25 years in Birmingham, Alabama. I got to work at a major medical center there called the University of Alabama at Birmingham. They're in the top 20 medical centers in the United States. Uh, it's a terrific place. And I had the opportunity to see that place grow and change. Birmingham, when I got there, was a city that wasn't doing that well on a lot of fronts, uh, and it reinvented itself around its academic health center called UAB, uh, the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Anyway, these are some pictures of what happened there, a picture of the community. I like to show this picture because Southwest Airlines came to town and that changed our transportation dramatically. The prices on Delta flights went way down, Delta Airlines started treating you like a human being, and everything changed, and we could get places fast. So it's really impressive what competition can do uh, in any area, and I was pleased to see that. This is a little restaurant called Highlands Bar and Grill. I put it on there because it's ranked as one of the top 10 restaurants in the United States every year. Who would have thought when I moved to Birmingham they'd have one of the top 10 restaurants in the United States competing with New York and San Francisco, and it wasn't that expensive either. The point being, this city reinvented itself. It's a $7 billion a year economic impact enterprise and they don't even have beautiful mountains and a beautiful river and a, as welcoming a community as we do here. Birmingham's a great place, but this is a greater place, and I think we can do it even better and have a great opportunity. So I'll close right there, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. I'll sit down. Okay. Get this off for Kim. Oops. I'm going to fix this microphone. Maybe. Thank you, Dr. Friedlander. Exciting news indeed. We are very fortunate to have your leadership here in Roanoke and we're looking forward to great things in, in the future. 
the work that you're doing is so impactful and meaningful to our community and to society. Um, and thank you very much for all that you're doing. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Kimberly Dunsmore, who serves as the Chair of Pediatrics and um, is responsible for the growth and development of medical education research and clinical strategic planning for pediatrics throughout Carilion Clinic. She manages the research program, faculty development needs, and strategic growth of clinical services within the department. Dr. Dunsmore is a nationally recognized expert in pediatric hematology oncology. She previously served as the division chief of pediatric hematology oncology at the University of Virginia Children's Hospital. She was also the associate chair for clinical program development and was named the Karen Jurgowski Endowed Chair for Pediatric Hermatology Oncology. She has authored or co-authored numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals and has been an invited presenter at numerous regional, national, and international conferences. She has received awards for both teaching and clinical excellence. Now Dr. Dunsmore will share details about Carilion Children's at Tanglewood and the role that it will play on the future of the 419 corridor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dunsmore. Thank you, Jill. Um, and thank you everyone for being here this morning. It's really hard to follow Mike. I've never had to do it before. I've always listened to him. He's always such an exciting um, speaker. But I want to thank you for the opportunity to join you this morning. We are very excited about all that is happening at Carilion Clinic, especially with Carilion Children's. Um, as Jill said, I'm Dr. Kimberly Dunsmore, the Chair of Pediatrics, and I'm here today to give some information about the new Carilion Children's facility we will open at Tanglewood Mall in the 419 corridor. As you probably saw in the news recently, we are developing a new facility for children's outpatient services at Tanglewood Mall. This development is needed now more than ever. Carilion now has more than a dozen pediatric subspecialties. And unless you've had a sick child recently, you may not be aware of all of the services that we actually have. We now have pediatric orthopedics, pediatric allergy and pulmonology, cardiology, dentistry, endocrinology, gastroenterology, hematology and oncology, neurology, surgery for different types of pediatric surgeries, child development, behavioral health, adolescent medicine, and pediatric and adolescent gynecology. Because of this growth, many of our patients and their, and their parents no longer have to travel outside of the region to receive excellent health care. At Carilion, we are always looking to make our services more convenient for our patients and families. This new facility will consolidate many of our children's services, making it easier for parents to get the care they need for their kids. It will become a one-stop shop for children's care. And we couldn't have asked for a better location than the Tanglewood Mall in the 419 corridor. It's centrally located to where many of our patients live, and it has a lot of parking and easy access. Now, we are still in the early stages of development, and we haven't decided exactly which of the many children's practices will move into that space, but it will allow us to have most of them under one roof, which will improve coordination throughout all of pediatrics, and especially for children with complex medical issues that need to see more than one subspecialist for their care. What we do know is that we are beginning construction this winter, and the location is expected to be up and running in 18 to 24 months. We have leased about 150,000 square feet of the mall, mostly where the JCPenney store was, and we are planning to renovate the entire space into a brand new, state-of-the-art medical facility. The renovation is expected to cost about $30 million, and it is part of the estimated $1 billion that Carilion is investing in capital projects in the next seven years across all of the communities we serve. We expect more than 200 Carilion employees to be working at the Tanglewood location when it's finished. And this will help improve the health of the Roanoke Valley, and that is our main goal. However, we also believe that this will help boost the economic health in Roanoke County. After all, improving the economy's health is one of the main ways we can improve a community's physical health. This project will breathe new life into the mall in that area, which is situated in one of Roanoke County's most trafficked commercial areas. As many of 
of you have seen, Carillion has launched several new development projects in the past few years that have helped drive an economic boost to their surrounding areas. The Institute for Orthopedics and Neurosciences, or ION, opened in the former Ucrops grocery store building just a few miles away. As you've seen, that property is now surrounded by a new thriving shopping center with an Earth Fair grocery store and several new restaurants. The growth of Carillion, Virginia Tech, and Radford University in the Roanoke Innovation Corridor has also been buttressed by the construction of new apartments, restaurants, and a hotel in the surrounding area. We think those ripple effects will happen at Tanglewood as well. This project will bring hundreds of people to the shopping center daily. Much of Carillion's work has been in the Roanoke Innovation Corridor, which I know has been discussed a lot. But the Innovation Corridor is more an ecosystem and less a defined place. In other words, we're all in this together. I think the new children's facility will help spur some of that innovation and growth in Roanoke County, like we've started to see in other parts of the region, as Mike described. The 419 Corridor and Tanglewood Mall, especially, have so much potential for growth I'm excited to see what's going to happen there in the next few years. I think it's a thrilling time to be in the Roanoke Valley, and I can't wait to see how many more good things we can make happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dunsmore. We too are excited about the future of Carillion Children's and the impact that you will be uh, contributing to at Tanglewood Mall in the 419 corridor. And I'd like to introduce Philip Thompson, Deputy Director of Planning for Roanoke County. Philip has been with Roanoke County for 13 years and he and his team have spearheaded the creation and implementation of the 419 plan. And today he's gonna to give you an overview of the the plan and the next steps in the implementation. Philip. Good morning. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, 419. Not so much the plan development, but looking at it more from the implementation side. All right. Let's see if this works. Yes. Um, so, um, we have developed an overall plan and there's an overall vision for the 419 Town Center plan. And part of the little bit of background, um, a couple of years ago we did an analysis of the county zoning uh, in the county and only about 4% of the county is zoned for commercial or industrial development. And of that, there's only about 1% that was available for new development. And so, uh, we had a conversation with the board to start looking at our existing commercial corridors trying to see where we could have increased development and the natural one was 419 and so we started with this 419 town center plan. Uh, it took a while, uh, two and a half years to develop the overall plan, uh, but we do have a vision and it's looking at how can we develop and redevelop this area into a kind of a town center uh, development pattern. In addition, uh, looking to expand the multimodal transportation systems. Uh, as was mentioned, you know, trying to have more uh, sidewalks and bike lanes is important, as well as transit and vehicular traffic. Uh, and also, where are some of our uh, open spaces that we can, uh, or have gathering spaces within this area as well. So, how do you make this overall vision come to life? And there are kind of three broad categories we're gonna talk about. Um, one is, there's a planning and zoning part of it, which is a kind of a regulatory framework that you have to work from. Um, seeing how our regulations allow this or don't allow this and what amendments we need to make happen. Uh, continuing community engagement uh, throughout this process. We had numerous efforts uh, during the planning process, but that doesn't stop with the plan adoption. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then also the infrastructure investments. We'll talk about what's been uh, recently funded and where are some other projects that we're trying to work on as well. So from a planning and zoning standpoint, the board did approve this plan uh, on July 23rd of this year. Um, and with that is now, okay, how do we make this happen? And so one of the first things I think we're gonna look at and we're working to find funding for is uh, from a design standpoint, from a zoning standpoint, dealing with those issues of density, uses, and form, uh, looking at building, you know, how do you site buildings on sites, 
looking at architecture, sidewalk and streetscape elements, uh, as well as open space requirements uh, and parking regulations. Do we need to make some adjustments to those to allow more of a town center feel? Also, you know, uh, also looking at future plans and plan review. Now that we've developed this plan, probably in five to ten years, we probably need to come back and look at it because conditions will change over time. Um, and what conditions have changed and what adjustments we have to make to actually the 419 Town Center plan. Um, but as I think Dr. Freelander mentioned, is trying how do we connect um, the Virginia Tech, Virginia, uh, the Freeland Biomedical Center with the 419 area and what type of future plans do you might we want to have. So, obviously, you mentioned the Franklin Road corridor, and we also have interest in looking at that Franklin Road corridor. Most of that is in the city. How do we work with the city uh, to connect, make those connections and connect 419 uh, Town Center with uh, the Virginia Tech Korean Medical S uh, School of Medicine and also the uh, Freeland Biomedical Center? And so, you know, you have this corridor today along uh, Franklin Road. Uh, he mentioned McDonald's, you have Burger King as well. Um, uh, but how do you transform, again, it's a similar plan implementation, but how can we maybe transform this to, you know, in the future to look something more like that, right? Is having it more walkable, having it more attractive to attract uh, the folks that are going to be working uh, down the road on Franklin Road. Uh, and that takes planning and future plans as well and other zoning mechanisms in place. So, um, as far as community engagement, how do we move forward with marketing and branding uh, this area? Um, part of the discussion is uh, we continually, our economic development folks do a great job uh, talking to property owners and landowners and businesses, uh, but also do we need to attract other uh, developers, whether they're in Virginia or this area or out of state, who have done multi-use projects and incorporate them uh, or you know, get them excited about this project as well and looking for opportunities for, are there opportunities for public and private uh, partnerships uh, to make this happen as well. Um, we have, uh, yeah, we'll also have this type of meeting. We should probably have a frequent meeting at least once a year, if not twice a year, to inform folks of what's going on in the corridor. Uh, we'll probably retool our website on 419 to be more of an implementation standpoint. Uh, we have a, uh, both economic development and community development have uh, electronic newsletters. If you're not part of that, I'd say see us because we inform people about that all the time. And we also have a 419 um, email distribution list where we try to uh, update folks as well. Um, and the last thing uh, is infrastructure investments. You know, is how do we make those projects come to fruition? You know, from a transportation standpoint, where we want to try to increase capacity or reduce congestion, you know, increase accessibility uh, along the corridor and throughout the town center. Uh, study area, you know, where do we add pedestrian and bicycle accommodations so people can safely um, you know, move between, again, that Franklin Road corridor, uh, improve interconnectivity and deal with access management to also improve uh, the functionality of 419 uh, and also incorporate street street improvements. Uh, parking was mentioned, you know, looking at at some point do we need to build structured parking versus surface parking uh, and also looking at how can we expand transit uh, and integrate that into the study area. And maybe there's a loop between downtown uh, Virginia Tech uh, Medical School and 419 at some point in the future. So I'm gonna talk about a few projects that are underway. Uh, hopefully you may know or may not know. This is kind of an overview map that shows a lot of those projects. We can say there's quite a few projects. And we'll talk about some of the funded projects. So um, before we actually started the 419 study, we actually received a grant uh, to look at uh, 419 in front of Tanglewood Mall. Uh, and what it, that project is going to do, it's a $6.5 million project. Um, it will construct a third lane on the south side, or what I call the Wendy side, of uh, um, 419 from 220 to Ogden Road. Uh, it will incorporate sidewalks and bicycle lanes as well. There will be pedestrian signals and crosswalks and a bus shelter will be incorporated as part of that and kind of consolidate um, the existing stops, uh, the transit stops along that road. So um, it's supposed to go to advertisement next year uh, or in the spring and hopefully construction uh, will start in the summer and uh, last for about two years. Uh, so that's a project that will add hopefully additional capacity to 419. Uh, 
Dr. Freelander mentioned the 419 um, 220 Diverging Diamond. Uh, this is a $17.5 million project. Um, this is again where we were able to leverage regional transportation dollars and state dollars for this project. Um, it would reconfigure the travel lanes and the ramps. Um, it would have bicycle and pedestrian accommodations so people could safely pass from you know, the, four nine, the Tanglewood side over to the city side. Um, and so it actually moves them into the middle, but they would have a protected island in the middle of the interchange. Um, it would also reduce the traffic signal phases. And so right now, they're, they're designing this project. Uh, right away is scheduled for uh, 2023 and construction being 2024. Uh, so it has moved up in the cycle. Uh, I think this original was a 2028 fa uh, phasing of the project. But again, uh, another project to help uh, with congestion in the area. Kind of similar, um, we've always had this conversation. We knew that anytime you deal with 419, uh, even though you add a third lane, uh, are you just creating another lane for people to park in if they can't deal with 220? And so um, VDOT is looking at uh, uh, 220. Uh, they're actually looking at it from Roanoke all the way down to the uh, North Carolina line um, in what they call a arterial preservation program, but part of that is they're looking at um, the 220 corridor in our area, and we put a plug up here, there is a community meeting scheduled for November 7th uh, at Clearbrook Elementary School, but what they're looking at is, you know, the intersections along that, and part of the issue is the through movement on those intersections uh, on the side streets, and looking at do they have to make some adjustments to that so you get more traffic moving down 220 than necessarily across 220. Uh, and so there are several intersections that are listed there that potentially uh, will look at the signal phasing of those intersections. So if you're interested, go to the meeting next week. Or, and, uh, but it does hopefully help move traffic through, and that's the importance, that by eliminating signal uh, phasing, what you could do is actually, it's almost like adding a third lane uh, to that facility without the cost. And so that's the importance of the signal phasing portions of, of the project. Um, this is partially funded, um, Fowler Water Lane, this is the road to Chuck E. Cheese, if everyone knows where Chuck E. Cheese is. Um, but this would actually go beyond Chuck E. Cheese and provide, uh, if anybody knows, that the land behind there on the hillside is zoned R3 and R4, which is um, zone for apartments. Um, again, so uh, this would provide better access to um, that section uh, or that property. Uh, so this is a four and a half million dollar project, I believe. We have two and a half million already funded. We, uh, the Board of Supervisors recently uh, supported a request to ask for additional revenue sharing money, which is a 50-50 match. And so we, are, we'll be, we have submitted that application to VDOT and hopefully we'll get that additional funding starting July 1st. Um, and so this is another project that would help implement the 419 study as well. Now this is a little outside the study area, but it's still important. Um, this is looking at signal coordination on 419 and 221. Um, this has been a project that's been funded for a while, um, but it's from 419 to be from Colonial Avenue to Valley Drive and on 221 from Garst Mill Road to Ranch Crest. Uh, and so the infrastructure is in place, and so hopefully this will be activated either late this year or early next year. Uh, and again, it deals with the platooning through intersections and hopefully they'll be coordinated. Um, as part of that, and make travel along 419 and 221 a lot better and smoother. Uh, a couple of proposed projects uh, that we have recently submitted. Um, uh, so we are looking uh, at the next phase of 419 uh, from Ogden Road to Starkey. Um, again, this is going to look at a little bit of road widening, bicycle lane, sidewalks, and pedestrian signals and crosswalks at Starkey Road. Um, so we submitted uh, a grant to the Regional Commission. Um, I think this is a eight to nine million dollar project. We submitted for the preliminary engineering, which is one and a half million dollars. Um, and hopefully if we get funded that money, we will then apply for smart scale, which is through the state. And if we're able to leverage local monies, that helps your score in getting some of these projects funded. And so uh, we have a great team that uh, uh, submits these applications and we've been very successful in getting awards uh, and so we look to hopefully uh, look at this next section as well on 419 um, and at least take it to Starkey and then obviously we'll move beyond that intersection as well in future years. And then the other project that we're, we submitted uh, again working with the city is to look at Ogden Road. Um, 
you know, down Ogden Road, there are many uh, apartment complexes. Uh, and so trying to connect them to the town center is uh, one, of our, one of the things that we'd like to see happen. And so we're working with the city. And so we, uh, we've already been out and started doing some preliminary investigation of where it actually would go. Uh, we submitted, again, a grant to the Regional Commission. I think it was $80,000. And that money is really to do the more investigative work of you know, what the actual design would look like, what side of the road, what are the actual features that will be incorporated in this. Um, and then from that, again, hopefully be able to parlay that into a uh, future uh, grant-funded project once we have a good cost estimate and so forth. So again, we're collaborating with VDOT in the city on this project. I think that might be the last one. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jill, who I think has some closing remarks. Thank you, Philip. In closing, I want to say that the 419 plan is a roadmap for transformation. This is going to be our guiding document for the future of 419 in Roanoke County. All of the partners that have come together today are working together to make this happen for the future of our community. We're all in this together. I also wanted to thank the Roanoke County Board of Supervisors and Administration for their leadership and commitment to the implementation of this plan and their recognition of the importance of this document to our community. And more importantly, I want to thank you, our community, our business leaders, our property owners, for all that you're going to do to help us implement this plan in working together with Roanoke County to make this happen. All of our speakers are going to be here after the meeting. If you have specific questions, feel free to ask them. They will be happy to answer. So thank you again for being with us today and have a great rest of your day.